Welcome to Hot Chips 22. Session 7, New Processor Architecture, and Closing Remarks. Good afternoon. My name is Bevan Boss from UC Davis, and this is our last session covering next, uh, sorry, new processor architectures. Our first speaker is Brian Curran. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin. He's been designing Z processors and uh, P, sorry, Z series and P series processors for 26 years at IBM, and is an IBM Distinguished Engineer. And he'll be speaking to us this afternoon on uh, IBM's new Z Enterprise 196 processor. Uh, thank you, and it's a privilege to talk to you today about the uh, recently announced IBM Z Enterprise 196 system and processor. Um, just before I start here, just a, a brief uh, uh, legal disclosure here. There will be no uh, characters uh, injured during the uh, delivery of this presentation. Um, Z Enterprise continues as CMOS mainframe heritage. Um, um, as some of you are familiar, we, we uh, uh, had many bipolar generations. Uh, we converted to CMOS as of 1997, and over the years we've systematically increased both the frequency and the, the complexity of our core. Um, as you see, we, we introduced a, a first generation 64-bit architecture. We went super scalar, and, and the last design of Z10, we implemented a brand new uh, deeper pipeline. And today I'll talk about the, uh, um, the, the new, brand new, wide su superscalar, out of order uh, Z196 core. All right, a little bit on the, on the system, a little bit of background. Um, these are not um, simple cores. These are, these are high frequency, aggressive, out of order execution cores. Um, and this is not just a talk on the, on the microprocessor, but it's also a, a discussion on the system. Um, the applications we run are extremely large, uh, mission-critical applications uh, that are ideal for large-scale data and transaction serv servicing. Uh, and such, we need large caches. Um, uh, we're really proud of the improvements we've made in traditional workloads and ZOS workloads. We get up to a 40% improvement relative to the previous generation, uh, and we achieve 60% uh, higher system throughput. Um, in addition, these systems are now being used, utilized uh, with, with these IFLs for large-scale Linux consolidation. We support thousands of Linux machines. Um, and, and the most amazing thing of all in my mind is this is a leading-edge, uh, high-performance CPU-intensive core. Um, we've achieved at constant code 40% thread improvement, which is unheard of. And additionally, we achieve another 20 to 30 percent improvement through recompilation. And we have, we have workloads running on our systems today um, with, with a sustained throughput of 400 billion instructions. Um, and all this was done with no net increase in energy consumption relative to the uh, prior Z10 system. All right, here is a die photograph of our quad core processor chip. You'll see the four cores in the corners here. Uh, we have private L, large private L2 caches. Uh, we have an on-chip memory controller. We have on-chip EDRAM L3 um, and, and some proprietary uh, uh, GX uh, I.O. interfaces. Uh, you see some of the uh, key characteristics there. Uh, this is uh, built in IBM's 45 nanometer uh, partially depleted SOI technology. You see the uh, large length of wire. Uh, we have 1.4 billion transistors. And uh, for the first time, industry leadership frequency, 
5.2 gigahertz. Now, now what, is, what does this mean? This is not a, a uh, short-term turbo frequency. This is a fully sustained 5.2 gigahertz, all 96 cores, 24-7, across all conceivable workloads. Uh, and we're very proud of this accomplishment. Um, in addition, on this chip, we have two coprocessors. Um, not, we've, we've had coprocessors for about 15 years now. These, these, these COPs uh, execute crypto and compression um, operations and are shared by two cores. OK, a little bit on our, our nodal structure. So on the CP chip, like I described, we have four private cores. Or four, four cores with private L1s. The LL2 is also private. We have a large uh, 24 megabyte shared EDRAM for uh, uh, L3. And six of these cores are placed on a multi-chip module, which are then fully interconnected to two uh, SC chips, system controller chips, or hub chips. Um, and, and at industry first, we have um, shared EDRAM level four cache, a total of 192 megabytes spread across those two chips. In addition, this node supports uh, up to three quarters of a terabyte of main memory. Now, at the system level, we can, we can um, uh, have up to four nodes in the frame. And when we have a four nodal system, um, they are fully interconnected through these FPC or fabric interfaces. Um, the other thing to note is the, the memory, the, the total supported memory that we will, uh, uh, that we can uh, uh, um, um, interconnect with will be uh, three terabytes for this large, large four node system. We have a total of 96 cores and a huge amount of uh, system cache. And you see the numbers there, uh, pretty impressive amounts of EDRAM, three quarters of a gigabyte L4 and over half a gigabyte of L3. All right, now this is a busy chart and I'll, 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 walk, I'll walk through this fairly slowly. I'll, I'll break it up into three, three separate pieces. So, the first part is the uh, front end in order instruction flow. Um, we have a, um, um, a very aggressive branch prediction uh, uh, circuitry which runs asynchronously, runs well ahead of iFetch, which predicts both the direction and the target. Uh, instructions are, are fetched out of an iCache. Up to three Z instructions are decoded, uh, cracked, and regrouped and, and uh, re uh, mapped in every cycle. Um, when we crack an instruction, a Z instruction, we break it up into one or more micro-ops, which are risk-like instructions. Up to three of those risk-like instructions are loaded into a, the issue queue, and we support uh, as many as uh, a total of 40, 40 micro-ops in our out-of-order uh, window size. Uh, and also to support in-order completion, those micro-ops uh, also are written into a global completion table. Um, like I said before, this is, a, this is a map design, so logical registers are actually mapped to physical registers. Okay, now, uh, this is all done in order. Okay, now the out of order section um, is, is, is quite aggressive. Uh, like I said, we have a 40 instruction window size. Uh, instructions are woken up once all their dependencies have been resolved. Um, and then an the age matrix pulls out the oldest ready to execute instruction, and then it's issued. We issue up to five risk-like micro-ops um, to the various execution units. Uh, we have two load store pipes, and and the uh, sorry, and the uh, they interface directly with a 128k data cache. We have two fixed point or integer pipes. Uh, we also have a a one binary floating point unit and one decimal floating point unit. Um, when these instructions execute, and they, they can execute randomly out of order, uh, they generate a finish report, and that, that, uh, which is then, uh, that, that information from the finish report is written into a global completion table. All right, now the final part is the completion part, and this is, this is done in order. So architecturally, a program cannot observe that instructions executed out of order, so this is where we, we bring things back into, into uh, original program order. Uh, we complete up to one group of three micro-ops per cycle, and all state associated with that group is committed uh, atomically 
uh, all the uh, architected uh, uh, register values and, and the mapper state, the store data associated with those instructions, the instruction address, and, and so on is committed. And all this data is hardened through ECC or, or duplicated structures, which are protected with parity. OK, our pipeline. Um, this is a, a, a radically different pipeline than we've imp implemented previously. Up on the uh, upper left-hand corner, you see there the uh, three instructions coming down. They're decoded, they're regrouped, and then they're dispatched to a instruction sequ sequencing unit, which is responsible for all the out-of-order processing. Uh, the the, the uh, operands are remapped, and we write the information into the issue queue. And then, and then in the green box is the out of order section. And this is where we do the wake up. We select the oldest, and then we issue it to the appropriate execution unit. And then you, um, you see the various execution units there. Um, the load store units, the load pipe is a, a four cycle pipe. We do address generation, two cycle decache access, and then we format the data before writing it, ba before writing it back to the register file. Uh, FX user execution cycle, we generate the condition code, write the data back. BFU is a, a uh, uh, eight or nine stage pipeline, depending on the, uh, the uh, whether it's hex or binary format. And then the DFU, the decimal floating point unit, is a, a variable length pipeline. Um, and, then, and then after, after uh, uh, all the instructions in a group are finished, then we go through the completion pipeline and the checkpointing pipeline on the right side of the diagram. Okay, um, an out of order design is really what you really want to do is you want to you want to uh, you want to achieve the data flow limit, and and to achieve the data flow limit, you have to make sure that or you have to um, execute dependent instructions as as uh, quickly as possible. So we've implemented a lot of data forwarding paths such that we can achieve close to the data flow limit on a lot of compute intensive workloads. So from the LSU. We are able to quickly forward the result back. We, we bypass the reg file completely, and we forward the data back to itself, to the other LSU, uh, and to both either FXU and, and with one cycle additional, additional delay to the binary floating point unit. Uh, we also implement back-to-back -back fixed point execution back to itself, uh, fixed point result forwarding with one additional cycle delay back to the other fixed point unit and back to the uh, uh, address generation cycle of the uh, load store unit. Uh, BFU, forwarding, very, very aggressive results from one floating point computation can feed uh, the source operand of a subsequent operation. And then finally, the, um, and I'll talk more about this near the end, but Z, unfortunately, is a CISC architecture and it has lots of operations Lots, lots of instructions which operate directly on storage. They get the operands from storage and the result is sent to storage. So we need to implement some very aggressive, uh, non-committed store result forwarding. And that, that actually occurs, um, you know, the, the store data is written from the FXU into a special store queue structure in the LSU and subsequent loads, which uh, are processed through the LSU, query the store queue. And if they get a hit, they forward the data into the uh, normal load path. Okay, uh, this is a CISC architecture. Um, we've passed the 1,000 instruction count. Um, 1,004 are, are, can be directly executed by the program. Uh, there are 75 instructions which uh, can only be executed by millicode or vertical microcode. Um, the most complicated instructions, of which there are 219, are executed by millicode. And, and these instructions, um, can take anywhere from 10 to thousands of uh, um, cycles to execute. Um, the, next, the next level of uh, instructions in terms of complexity are actually cracked at decode time into two or more risk like microops. Uh, we have 269, what I call RX instructions, which are cracked at issue time, which essentially means they're dual issued. They're first issued to the load store unit to get the one storage operand from the cache and then they're subsequently issued to a fixed point or a floating point pipe to actually do the, architect, uh, the uh, arithmetic computation. 
Um, and then we have 16 uh, special storage storage ops, which are executed by a LSU uh, 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 sequencing state machine. And the remaining Z instructions are, are risk-like, and they just map one-to-one -to, -one to a single micro op. Okay, a little bit on the instruction cracking flavors. Uh, there's some which unconditionally crack at decode. Um, we often use a scratch register or condition code to pass the intermediate results from one micro op to another. And a compare and swap is, is an example of that, and I'll, I'll actually walk you through that example next. The other class is a, a class of instructions that are conditionally cracked at decode based on the length of the operand. We have a variable length move instruction and we, we achieved a, a significant performance benefit by not actually implementing this in the LSU sequencer, uh, instead implementing it through a, 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 a distinct load and store. Uh, we have another class where we conditionally uh, at decode uh, a crack it based on the, the overlap of the operands. And an example of that is an exclusive OR operation, which our, our, uh, our programmers in Z like to use to uh, clear out storage. They'll, off, they'll set the both source operands to the identical address and effectively clear out storage. And then the last, last class I, I already talked about, that was where it's cracked at issue. Uh, it's effectively a, 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 a operand where one source is from um, um, storage and the other source is from a register. Okay, here's an example of, of compare and swap. Now, I tried to think about how to, how to explain this instruction. This is a CISC instruction, and it's used by software primarily to implement locks. And, and so the the clear, clearest way to think about this instruction is it's a, a way to test the location in memory, typically to see if it's zero, and if it's zero, to have this instruction store a non-zero value into that memory location. In this way, two threads um, will, will uh, effectively communicate through a lock. And since it executes atomically, there's no way that both threads can see the zero. So, Let's talk about how we process instruction through our pipeline. So, so the compare and swap is in our instruction register, and then we decode it and crack it, and it, comes, and it gets cracked into two separate micro-ops initially, a, a, a dual issue instruction, uh, which I'll describe in a minute, and then, the, and then a subsequent micro-op, which conditionally stores back into that memory location. So initially, the, the, uh, lo the load and store pretest um, is, is issued because it's the oldest uh, next uh, ne ready to complete uh, oldest next let me let me phrase this differently it is the uh, uh, the oldest ready to complete instruction and it's issued to the load store unit pipe um, which does the load and returns the data um, and writes it back to a reg file and it also sets up the load store unit to do a potentially do a, a store operation um, the second part of the dual issue then is, is um, um, executed by the fixed point unit. And you notice here I'm, I'm showing the bypass path where the, the data from the load store unit is bypassed directly into the FXU. The FXU does the compare operation and generates a condition code. That condition code is then forwarded to uh, the other FXU pipe um, and the, uh, um, the um, conditional store instruction is issued to that fixed point pipe. And depending on the, the value of the condition code, the store actually um, is actually committed to uh, storage or it's not committed. Okay, um, just a few minutes here. I, I talked about the Z uh, architecture and, and the complexity. Um, this is the first Z design that has attempted to execute uh, loads and stores out of program order. Um, and it's been a very difficult and, and time-consuming process for us because storage hazards are very common in Z and more common than other platforms. And it's for two reasons primarily. First, we have a large base of Z legacy code that has not recently been re-optimized, and this code exploits this super-rich CISC storage-based instruction set. And, and I give you an example here. So, so it's very common. COBOL and other languages and, and uh, um, um, even more recent code to do decimal operations. And, and the original decimal operations that were defined for uh, System 360 back uh, many years ago operate directly on storage. So, so if you want to add, uh, do a decimal add of two numbers, though you take the numbers from storage, you add them, and you store it back to a location in memory, uh, another location in storage. Subsequently, you may want to pack or unpack this, this value. And again, that instruction reads storage and, and 
writes it back to storage. So this causes us uh, uh, lots of complexities in our design, and I'll, I'll explain how we dealt with these three issues, the functional correctness problem, the store hit load performance, and the load, uh, load hit store performance. Okay, so here, here's the example. So um, at, at decode time, uh, we process and store instruction A and load instruction B on the upper right there. Um, and at the time when you're decoding instruction, you do not know the addresses are the same. Right? It cannot be predicted because the address is not known until you actually do the agent during execution time. So what we've implemented is a special store queue to, to make sure that these stores and loads are actually executed in the proper order. So to, to illustrate this, I, I, I put here a store A timeline. So you can think of a store of a multiple phases. So the first thing you would do when you execute a store is to compute the, uh, the store address. And we, I called that store pretest in the previous slide. And then subsequently, you would copy the store data to the store queue and then generate a finished report. And then once that store is now the oldest instruction uh, uh, to be completed, um, you then write that store data back into the data cache. Well, consider the case where the load is executed well, is executed out, or, executed out of order and well ahead of the store. So now the problem here is the load is getting the wrong value from storage, right? It, the data is not written back to the data cache, so, the, so this is a functional correctness problem. So when, the, when this load B initially executes, we write its address into a load queue. Um, when store A executes, its address will be compared to all load addresses in the load queue. And in this case, we hit the load B entry. That, that essentially means the load B got the wrong data. So to correct this situation, we, we take the load B and the younger instructions and fl flush them from the pipeline and re-execute. Uh, but the good news is after this learning phase, subsequent dispatches of load B will be made. We now know load B is dependent on load A, and we'll, we'll make those dispatch. When we dispatch load B, we'll make it dependent on store A. OK, the other, the other case is the uh, load hit store case. And this is, this is where we spent a lot of energy. Um, there, was, there was lots of performance uh, to be lost if we didn't get this right. And in this case, store A executes and writes its address to the store queue. Everything is fine. Load B executes. Its address is compared to, er to every address in the store queue. And it hits store A. So if sto the store data is available in the store queue, then we directly forward it into the load B path, and, and the, the, uh, the request or the load data is none the wiser. Okay. Um, if the store queue data is not in the store queue, then we reject load B, and we reissue it until the store data is either in the store queue or it's in the L1 cache. And then the final case is the, uh, is the, uh, the simple case where this is when the, the, we're post hazard. And in this case, the load B is just serviced normally from the uh, data cache. OK, uh, I talked a little bit about the recompilation. So we've had a very good um, interaction with our compiler team. And with, through this collaboration, we've identified many different uh, uh, types of instructions that can help accelerate um, spec-like workloads, business analytics workloads, uh, Java applications, and so on. Uh, so the first thing we, we implemented uh, was this high word extension. Z architecture, unfortunately, is somewhat constrained by the number of registers, um, just because of the, the way the iText, um, the, the, the amount of bits available in the iText. So we only have 16 general purpose registers. But with this extension, we can effect, effectively give software uh, 32 word size registers. And we've implemented a lot of arithmetic operations that can add the high word of one register to the low word of another register, for example, and write the result back to the high word. Also, for Java applications, we've implemented some new atomic ops, uh, load in and, load in or, and, and so on. Uh, we've implemented a load pair disjoint, which is very useful, where uh, uh, software can load two different, uh, load data from two different storage locations into two different GRs, and the condition code will indicate to software whether those fetches were interlocked. And the last thing, the last class of instructions we implement were a conditional loads, stores, and, and register copies. So this is, this is very important. We have certain code where the branches are highly unpredictable. And in this old code case, we'll have a branch which is typically uh, is, is half the time it's taken, half the time it's not taken. 
And so it's very hard to predict whether that load should be executed or not. So, so with this new code, we're actually able to implement the compare, and then based on the, re the condition code of that compare, uh, we will conditionally do a load, and then we'll proceed with the, uh, the rest of the instruction stream. So we've got, we've, essentially what we've done here is we've gotten rid of these highly unpredictable branches. Okay, in summary, um, this is a major advance in, in System Z processor design. This is a very deep, high-frequency, uh, industry-leading 5.2 gigahertz pipeline. Um, many in the industry didn't believe that, that such frequencies are possible, but even, even more importantly, this is not a simple speed demon design. This is a design which implements very aggressive, out-of-order execution on top of high frequency. And the combination of these two things gives this, this core uh, tremendous uh, uh, performance gains on CPU-intensive uh, apps. I already talked about the four-level cache hierarchy uh, with, the, with the large amount of EDRAM. Um, and there's been uh, uh, lots of synergy between the hardware and software design. I talked about the ISA extensions, the compiler and microarchitecture co-optimization. To fully exploit this core, uh, the compiler needs to know, um, for example, the grouping rules and, and, and um, how instructions get cracked um, so they can achieve, they can, they can generate super efficient binaries. Um, you know, in the end, we've achieved what we set out to achieve. We've got a uh, 40% performance gain in existing uh, compute intensive code and additional gains when we recompile. This base technology was announced in, uh, in just a month ago and we plan to ship this later this year. Thank you, I have zero seconds. We have uh, some time for questions. Please uh, state your name and affiliation. Hi, uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel. Um, how would you characterize the uh, performance improvements in the new Z series design between the changes you made on out of order, the uh, bigger on-chip caches, as well as going to a write-back cache on the processor to the external cache chip? How would you characterize those three big enhancements in terms of their net performance improvement? Uh, was that specifically on CPU intensive apps? Um, either way, you could talk about well, okay. CPU intensive or normal apps. Well, I'll, I'll talk about CPU intensive apps. That's the easiest. So um, the larger caches didn't really help that at all because those apps already fit in our, our, our caches. So the out of order um, was you know, a big chunk of the improvement. The frequency gain was a big chunk, and then the recompilation was a, a, a large, uh, accounted for a large part of that uh, improvement. And they're roughly a third each. And uh, what about the write back, moving the processor to a, a store in, I believe is the term you use no, for that? No, that, that, that really didn't affect the, the, uh, the performance gain at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, from this side. Intellectual Ventures. Uh, so I noticed that you have uh, separate pipelines for memory accesses, loads and stores, and integer execution units, um, as, as opposed to a load op, store, uh, load op pipeline. The only time I ever got to talk to Robert Thomas Sulo, he asked me why the Intel P6 had uh, you know, a separate load store pipelines and execution units and was not load op. And Thomas Sulo said that he thought that the IBM 360 would always need a load off pipeline. Well, we proved him wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, idea of why? Well, every, every design that I've been associated with, you know, I've been in IBM 26 years, has done a, a RX pipeline, right? Uh, where the load pipe and the execution pipe have been sort of joined at the hip, right? But the cracking innovation that we, we, we've done here allowed us to separate those into risk-like pipelines. So now, now we get additional execution bandwidth. We have loads which don't need a, a execution pipeline and therefore they're not taking down the fixed point pipeline. And we've implemented some fast bypasses such that we effectively get the performance of an RX pipeline. Hi, Charlie Demergen from Semi-Accurate. Uh, how does IPC compare between this generation and the last? Um, IPC on constant code was, uh, you know, it varied dramatically depending on the workload, you know, 20, 20 uh, to 30 percent higher. Thanks. Uh, Chris Rosanovich, UCB. 
Uh, UC Berkeley. I had a question on your conditional cracking at deco time. So do you, how do you know the length and the overlap at deco time? Do you predict it? Um, actually, we can, it's, it's directly, uh, um, it, you, it can be computed directly from the ITEX. The length is actually a field in the ITEX. And then the, the overlap can also be computed by looking at the, the base register and the displacement. So we can do a displacement uh, uh, difference to figure out what the overlap is. Uh, Don Draper, two seconds. Last circuit. question. Um, what's the power dissipation? And what uh, means do you take for uh, reducing power by such things as dynamic frequency voltage scaling? Okay. Um, I can't disclose the power dissipation of the chip, but what I can tell you is it, it, it's, it's been consistent over the last four or five generations. <laughs> We've not increased the power. Um, to support this high frequency, we had to do a lot of aggressive clock gating, fine grain. So each pipe stage that I showed there in that, that slide has an individual clock control. Um, and we do extensive circuit tuning. We, we have multiple VT levels. And if a, a circuit's not on a critical path, their, their VTs are, are raised. And we do some, we have pr proprietary uh, circuit tuning tools also. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Our next speaker is Mike, Mike Butler of AMD. He has received his BS, MS, and PhD, PhD degrees from the University of Michigan. He's been at AMD for eight years where he is now a fellow. And he'll be speaking to us about the AMD uh, bulldozer. Thank you, Bevan. Good afternoon. I'm gonna be talking about bulldozer today. And bulldozer core is really the uh, result of the hard work of uh, a very large team of enormously talented individuals across AMD. I've got the honor today of presenting the results of that uh, effort. AMD is actually announcing two different cores today and disclosing the results of, uh, or the details of both cores. Um, together, these cores address the, the full range of the uh, target markets. At the high end is the bulldozer core, and this is the high performance, high scalability core. It's a, it's a from scratch core that was designed to target the, the full range of mainstream client and server markets. So everything from laptops, desktops, the entire server range up to and including uh, HPC markets. At the uh, low power and small area form factor uh, segment of the market, the Bobcat core is our new core that's gonna be targeting the high mobility markets of uh, netbook and thin and light notebooks. So I'm gonna be describing the bulldozer core in some detail and following my presentation, Brad will cover the Bobcat core. So bulldozer is a from scratch design. It was developed uh, starting many years ago and we started with some foundational observations about how this core would be used in SOCs going forward. And the, the first observation was that we would always be building SOCs that implement multiple threads of execution. So even in the client space, we anticipated building two or four cores worth of uh, thread throughput. This led us to uh, set a design goal of, of building a monolithic entity that was capable of two threads worth of execution. The other observation that we made was that we would always be operating in a power constrained environment, both in the client space with a, with a smaller power budget, but also in the server space where you, you try to optimize the number of cores you can implement reasonably in a given fixed SOC power budget. So we built in power efficiency and active power management from the, the inception of the project all the way through its development. What we've delivered is a, a two tightly linked cores that share resources for area and power efficiency. We made a number of uh, instruction set extensions, most notably the floating point multiply accumulate uh, extension and uh, we designed the, the, power, the core to be power efficient uh, from its inception. So starting with the microarchitecture all the way through its implementation. The goals for the project were defined in terms of delivered performance at a given power envelope or a given TDP for that uh, core. And this led us to the strategic direction of, uh, of targeting a low gate count per clock design. So we, we 
designed the microarchitecture from the beginning to support a, a low gate count per clock. Obviously, this has implications on the pipeline. We offset those uh, IPC impacts with further IPC enhancements, predominantly in the area of instruction and data prefetching, which I'll go into in some detail. The initial instances of the bulldozer core will be delivered in 2011 in uh, SOCs that serve the high end of the desktop and the server markets. This presentation is focused exclusively on the core and features of the core, so we won't be talking about the details of those SOCs until uh, uh, closer to launch for those products. So the first major uh, design decision that we addressed in the development of the bulldozer progress or project was um, how to implement the, the, the multiple threads of execution and how much logic to share between the two threads. There's really a full continuum of sharing opportunities uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you set out to implement two threads worth of throughput. And the two extremes of this sharing continuum are what you typically see in the market today. So on the left is the share everything scenario where uh, you, you build an SMT processor. And with this approach, you, you build a single core and you make the observation that as a, a single thread runs on a dedicated core, it typically underutilizes the, the peak bandwidth that's available at different points uh, throughout that core. If you make that excess, available or excess bandwidth opportunistically available to a second thread, uh, you get highly area uh, efficient processing. You make good utilization of the area. The downside is that you get unpredictable thread uplift when adding that second thread. Sometimes you get a 20% uplift, sometimes you get nothing. On the other uh, end of that uh, spectrum is the CMP approach, which is uh, essentially share nothing. So for each thread you want to support, you dedicate uh, a full core to it. This has the advantage of avoiding that, um, that thread interference and providing rust, robust thread throughput for each core. You get a predictable amount of performance when you start up a thread on, on a dedicated core. There's, uh, those are the two extremes of that sharing spectrum, and there are, there are intermediate points in between. And on Bulldozer, uh, early in the development, we looked at both of those extremes, but we also looked at intermediate points in between and tried to optimize for power efficiency while maintaining that uh, robustness and full thread performance of the CMP. So conceptually, we started Bulldozer with, uh, by hypothesizing an aggressive single threaded uh, execution uh, core and we implemented two of them side by side in a CMP configuration. We ran threads on both and, and stepped back and looked for opportunities to share. So we wanted to uh, preserve the, the, the full robust uh, heavy thread performance that a CMP delivers, but take advantage of every opportunity we could to share. So we established some guidelines for when it was profitable for hardware to share. And um, we made some observations. One is that, uh, there are certain regions of the chip where the utilization that a single thread uh, performs is, is bursty and inherently uh, sporadic. So a good example of this is the front end. Following a mispredict and in the presence of back pressure from the execution engines, uh, that, front end, that front end bandwidth goes idle. And if it's an aggressive front end, that's a significant portion of the time. That bandwidth can be made available to, a, to another thread. The other area that we looked at was to identify cases where we could reap an area benefit and uh, allow two threads to, to get uh, a healthy throughput on that shared resource and scaling up that resource to accommodate that uh, didn't impact critical latencies or uh, uh, complexity. An example of this is a floating point unit. Floating point apps tend to be less latency sensitive than integer apps, so we could afford to invest heavily in that floating point unit, increase its bandwidth, increase the depth of its uh, queuing, and uh, without negatively impacting the single thread performance while it was running on that uh, logic in isolation. And the third area that we explored was we tried to identify areas where we could make big bets on functionality or capacity and amortize the, the cost of that in terms of area and power across the two threads. So we invested heavily in a feature 
and uh, amortize that cost. An example of that is our data prefetcher, which I'll describe later. So what we ended up with is the bulldozer module, and this is a monolithic uh, dual core building block. So it, it has a shared uh, front end, and the front end is composed of the uh, fetch, branch predict, and decode units. The, uh, that, that shared front end feeds dedicated integer schedulers and a shared floating point unit. The uh, level two is also shared between the threads. The motivation for keeping the integer execution units, uh, as well as the, which also contain the, the load store unit and level one cache, dedicated to a per thread is again to deliver that robust per thread throughput and eliminate that cross thread interference and, and competition for critical latency sensitive resources. So what this organization gives us is greater scalability and greater predictability in terms of thread throughput. The, the estimates that uh, we've come up with are that it delivers 80% of that CMP performance, but with much less area and power. So you can take that power and then translate that back into additional performance. So now I'm going to dive deeper into some of the details of the module microarchitecture. And what's shown here is the, the shared front end of the machine. And again, the, the shared front end is the branch prediction, instruction fetch, and decode pipelines. And one of the key features of the uh, shared front end is the decoupled branch prediction and fetch pipelines. There's some uh, very good physical reasons in terms of timing that we, we wanted to decouple those two pipelines from each other. But it also enables a key performance feature that we support, which is prediction-directed instruction PFETCH. And I'll go into uh, a deeper dive on that in a couple slides. The instruction cache is 64K two-way and supports a 32-byte fetch from one thread or the other at any given time. We made a significant investment in the instruction TLBs and uh, the, the decode pipeline, which is four instructions wide, it pulls four x86 instructions out of the fetch queue and converts those into four internal uh, format operations. Uh, also supports branch fusion, where, where we take two independent x86, uh, a compare and a branch instruction, and merge those into a single uh, internal UOP for dispatch and execute purposes. The uh, once a group of instructions hits the, the bottom of that decode pipeline, that, that forms a dispatch group, and those that group of dispatched ops goes to one of the dedicated uh, core execution cores. So what I'm going to describe here are some of the characteristics of, of one of those cores. So just keep in mind that we've got two identical copies of these cores within the bulldozer module. The core itself uh, implements a number of uh, features for power efficiency. We do physical register file-based renaming for power efficiency. We also do uh, weight prediction on the level one data cache. The core itself includes the integer scheduler, the integer execution uh, data path, as well as the level one data cache and the uh, load store unit. The, the integer execution core also controls all of instruction retirement. So as operations complete on the floating point side, they report their completion status back to the integer core, which uh, coordinates retirement. The shared floating point unit continues in the AMD tradition of a coprocessor organization, and it continues in the uh, tradition of strong floating point performance from AMD. We made some heavy investments in the execution bandwidth and in the, the scaling of this uh, execution unit so that it would support two robust threads worth of uh, throughput, even when sharing. And when a single thread is running, all that bandwidth is available to that single thread. The floating point load buffer, which is shown at the bottom, um, accepts the, the load uh, data that comes from each of the cores. So the execution cores perform loads and stores on behalf of both the integer uh, execution path as well as the floating point. So those, each core are independently potentially returning load data to the floating point uh, unit. So that floating point load buffer is a bandwidth matching structure. The shared L2 uh, is where we made a heavy investment in uh, uh, our data prefetching. This is in shared logic. We dedicated uh, a significant amount of area to that uh, for the benefit of both threads. We also made a significant investment in memory concurrency and that shared L2 supports 23 uh, outstanding misses. 
So diving down a little bit into the prediction directed instruction prefetch as a theme on the bulldozer project, we invested heavily in, in prefetch uh, as a mechanism for improving performance. And we did this both on the instruction and the data side. So on the instruction side, uh, what's shown here is the um, uh, branch prediction pipeline is shown by the level one BTB and level two BTBs. And in reality, there's a number of other branch prediction structures. We have an indirect target array and a return stack and all the normal branch prediction features. But the, the control of that branch prediction pipeline is really driven by the uh, L1 and L2 BTBs. That pipeline runs free and produces a stream of future fetch addresses and populates that prediction queue, which is dedicated per thread. The instruction pipeline pulls from that queue and uh, after a, an, an initial demand miss, it'll continue to interrogate that prediction queue and search for subsequent misses that it's uh, soon to encounter when it resumes fetching after that initial miss is serviced. So what this allows us to do is to launch subsequent instruction cache misses uh, under the shadow of the initial miss. This turns out to be a highly effective form of instruction prefetch. And the, the key feature here is that the capacity of that L, the combined capacity of that L1 and L2 BTB, which is, is very significant, the L1 BTB is 512 entries, the L2 BTB is 5K entries. That footprint or that control flow footprint captures a very large instruction footprint. So uh, as long as an app fits within that BTB, we'll effectively be able to pull it into the iCache and bring it into via prefetching. On the data side, we made a similarly, uh, uh, or perhaps even more aggressive investment in uh, prefetching. Uh, we implemented a number of uh, more conventional stride-based prefetchers, aggressively supporting the number of strides and the stride distance. We also implemented these at multiple levels in the hierarchy. So there's a stride prefetcher that resides in the level one dcache as well as in the level two dcache. Each of the local prefetchers prefetches into that uh, level of the, the hierarchy. But the big place where we made an investment and where we've brought um, significant innovation to the, the processor is in the non-strided data prefetcher. And this prefetcher observes uh, clusters of misses and, and search for, identifies relationships between those that are not simple strided relationships. Once it captures and trains on uh, a, a fixed or a, an irregular relationship between a, a group of misses, it applies that uh, relationship to subsequent misses and effectively prefetches. The combination of that non-strided data prefetcher and the striding prefetchers uh, results in, in robust performance characteristics across a wide, load, a wide range of workloads, both client and server. So now I'm gonna pop up a level and talk about the threading model because at, at different points in the, the bulldozer module, uh, threading control is, is treated differently. So what's shown here is um, the three different threading models that are uh, in practice in the, the bulldozer module. What's shown in yellow are areas of vertical multi-threading. And with vertical multi-threading, a given pipe stage is, is performing work on behalf of one thread or the other, but not both. And it may switch the very next cycle to, to the other thread. So everything shown in yellow uh, is vertically multi-threaded. What's shown in green are areas that are dedicated to the single thread. So these are uh, completely unaware of the existence of uh, the other thread, and they're focused in, entirely on a single thread. So the, the cores, for instance, are, are dedicated per thread. And the uh, areas that are shown in red are areas of, of SMT or thread agnostic logic. The, the, the core of the floating point execution unit, the scheduler and the execution uh, data path are essentially SMT. And the uh, L2 is, is primarily thread agnostic. It's servicing uh, physical memory requests. Bulldozers implemented a number of uh, instruction set extensions in order to pursue performance improvements uh, via that dimension. Now we've implemented uh, SSE all the way up through uh, 4.2. The significant investment that, that Bulldozer brings to the uh, AMD family is the uh, support for AVX, including the AES uh, subset and the uh, FMAX subset. There's a, a set of extensions that are AMD specific which is the XOP instructions as well. In terms of features, Bulldozer's implemented a new feature uh, called lightweight profiling. This is a user level profiling technique where you can 
configure certain events to be tracked, and when they exceed a certain threshold, a configurable threshold, it'll dump a, a record into user space. This is a new feature on Bulldozer. As I said, we were focused on power efficiency and uh, power management from the, for the entire lifetime of the development of Bulldozer. Uh, we started the, the definition of the microarchitecture with power efficiency in mind. So uh, a lot of the sharing is uh, motivated by power efficiency, as well as the minimization of data movements in a lot of the ways we've uh, solved some of the microarchitectural issues. On top of that, we've uh, implemented extensive uh, clock and power gating to arrive at, at what is inherently a power efficient uh, microarchitecture. Building upon that, we implemented aggressive uh, power management. So we digitally measure activity throughout the core, uh, throughout the module, and use that as a, a proxy for power. If we're actually executing below our power budget, we increase the frequency to uh, take advantage of that, that power headroom. We also support uh, chip level uh, core power gating. So in conclusions, the, the, the bulldozer module is really the first generation of, of a future roadmap of parts. And there's a, 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 a pipeline of uh, derivatives that are in progress based on this uh, initial core. It's uh, the bulldozers at the heart of the 2011 family of mainstream processors, both the desktop and the server market. It represents a major investment in power and area efficiency and scalability, as well as uh, ISA extensions that we intend to build on going forward. It delivers a significant improvement in performance per watt. And the, uh, this is via that unique combination of, of shared and dedicated hardware. So we deliver robust per thread performance or, uh, or, or general purpose throughput. Um, again, we estimate that we deliver 80% of the CMP uh, equivalent performance, but with much less area and power. And throughout all this, we uh, never lost sight of the importance of single-threaded execution. So uh, a lot of the shared resources, a lot of the uh, shared bandwidth, when a single thread is running, is all available to that single thread. So in, in closing, I think it's uh, fair to say that we're very excited about Bulldozer. It's been a long road uh, to bring a, a from scratch core to the market. And we're, uh, we're excited to bring these innovations to the market and, and build on them going forward. So, if you have questions. Uh, Tarek Sharma, uh, University of Waterloo, Cisco. So for your um, back-end cores, each of them, can they like um, have two loads and one store per cycle? Uh, the question was, does each core support two loads and one store per cycle? Yes, they're so, completely independent. So uh, each backend core can do three memory ops per cycle? Correct. OK, and for your non-stride uh, prefetcher, I mean, sort of what, um, what algorithms does it use, or what sort of um, uh, correlation does it attempt to figure out from the access patterns? Yeah, so it's a complicated uh, okay. algorithm, <laughs> and we're not getting into the details of, uh, of that okay, exact so algorithm. What's the latency of that? I'm sorry, we have a lot of uh, people want to ask questions, so please uh, ask one question each. I'll move to this side. My name is Jason Wang of Sony Computer Entertainment. Um, actually, I have two questions. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just one. Oh, Pick okay. So, uh, you talk about uh, two cores share the same L2 cache, and uh, we have prefetch. I just wonder if that's possible, one call prefetch for another call. So I missed the question. Oh, it's certainly possible that you get constructive data sharing between the two. Yes, one, one core can bring it into the L2, and the other core can use it. Yes. OK, thank you. Nathan Brookwood. Uh, on that uh, B, the level one and level two BTBs, are those shared between both cores, or is that do, does each core have its own? They're shared between both cores. Thank you. Yep. 
Christopher Sinovich, UC Berkeley. I'm interested in the level one decached wave prediction. Could you say something about the way you do that and what the hit latency is? Uh, so we're not we're not going to talk about details of the in terms of the accuracy of the uh, wave prediction. The algorithm is essentially a, a mini tag uh, comparison that we do very early in the pipeline to to drive wave selection. Thanks. Uh, Kevin Creel from NVIDIA. Actually, there's so many questions we could ask. Uh, I'll just ask for a simple question. On your, uh, your, your, uh, your threading model, are you, uh, are you, are you taking uh, ping pong or e e the uh, decoder stage, the, or say the yellow stages are alternating between the two threads, and then when one thread is stalled, you'll, you'll fill in uh, with the uh, non-stalled thread? Yeah, so um, I guess I could go into a little more detail on this. Can they not see this? There it is, right there. Okay, yeah, so um, each box is a different, uh, what we call a thread domain, and each box represents a section of the pipeline. So at the start of that pipeline, we make a thread switch decision, and the thread switch decision is based on a number of factors, um, fairness being one, mm -hmm. certainly stall being another. If one thread is stalled, we'd, we'd pursue the other thread uh, with full bandwidth. Um, and also target occupancy of the, the target queue. So we want to favor the thread that's most in need of uh, new work to be done. So each one of those boxes is performing a thread switch decision at the start of that pipeline. That transaction, if you will, flows through that pipeline and dumps it into that decoupling queue. So there's the branch predict, ifetch, and decode thread domains that are all making independent decisions. The dispatch thread domain is also making an independent decision. And that decision really flows into that front end of the floating point, uh, mm -hmm. the front end. So there's really one decision for that dispatch in, uh, into the floating point. Okay, thanks. Eric Barnard with CT Magazine. Does the floating point unit actually read and write L1 cache? It, it looked like it was not connected on the slide, but then there were errors pointing in. Right, so the, the integer core uh, performs load and store operations on behalf of both the integer execution as well as the floating point. So that load store unit pulls, performs load stored uh, on behalf of the floating point. If it comes out of the L1 cache, so be it. If it pulls it from, up from the L2 and then over, then that's certainly possible. This is uh, Jeff Howard, Intel Corp. Uh, do you intend to follow this implementation of Bulldozer with one that includes the Fusion architecture? So again, we're not talking about uh, SOCs, but um, we have stated that this, uh, this is the core that we're building our future uh, roadmap from, and our future roadmap is certainly all about fusion, so. Uh, and just a clarification, on the first slide you showed, uh, uh, good for laptops and desktops, but then you kind of said you were concentrating on uh, high-end desktop and servers. Is this uh, extendable to mobile? So that statement was about 2011. The initial SOCs that uh, implement the bulldozer core are going to be targeting the high-end desktop and servers. Beyond 2011, we'll be targeting other markets with this core. Thank you. Nadeem Firasta, Intel. You mentioned that this uh, module has core-level power gating. Exactly what part of the die would be turned off or power, power gated? Because it seems like there are shared parts of the die that are shared between the two threads. So right. how does that work? Right, so we power gate the, the module uh, as a, in its entirety. So it's the full module power gated off. So you would never power gate at the thread level. You would always do it at the Correct. module level. Correct. Uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel Corporation. Do the uh, caches remain exclusive the way existing AMD processors are? So within the bulldozer module, we've got a level one and a level two uh, cache. Those are mostly inclusive. Uh, typically, and historically, what AMD has done at the SOC level is maintained exclusive uh, level two caches with respect to the level three. But that's an SOC level decision that, that's really not a decision for the core. Okay, so the L1 is inclusive with the L2. Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker.
Our next speaker is Brad Burgess. He received the BS and MS degrees from Texas A&M University. He spent 15 years at Motorola leading the architecture for several PowerPC designs. He then spent three years at Intel, and he's now been at AMD for eight years, and he'll be speaking to us uh, today about the AMD Bobcat. Before I get started, I'm going to take a risk at trivia and at least clarify some of the blogs that have been running around lately. Bobcat really has a dual meaning that we've played with back and forth as a design team. On one hand, if you've been to a construction site in North America, you'll find these little white mini bulldozers, which is one play on a small mini bulldozer core. The other aspect of it is the Felix, Lin or Felix Rufus, or Lynx Rufus, depending on what taxonomy you like, which is a little scrappy wildcat native to North America. And so we've played off both at times. The latter is what ended up on the design shirts, in case you're curious. As Mike kind of introduced it, uh, this is the second from scratch core AMD has done in parallel here. Uh, the Bobcat core is really targeted for the low power market, uh, scaling from netbooks all the way up into the low end client notebook. To take a step back, what the problem was we were trying to address, a uh, couple of things. One is we wanted to be a very low power core. Obviously there's markets there that we wanted to go address. Uh, second part is we wanted to be a small, tiny core for cost reasons and plus also power since to scale relatively linearly with area, which caused a problem when you want to get excellent performance out of it. So the bottom line direction behind the Bobcat core is how do you really build a small, highly, efficiency, highly efficient design? Uh, and that's what you'll find as we go through the microarchitecture has been the driving direction of what we've been trying to do here. The second part of it is we want it to be a synthesizable design. We want to be able to take this core to other process, uh, to map it quickly, to take it various arenas and give us the flexibility to do a number of things with this core. At the same time, tiny, small, low power, we wanted to have a rich, rich feature set. Uh, this is a full 64-bit instruction set. It's the AMD 64 x86 ISA. Uh, we've got all the SSC extensions through SSC3, through the supplemental SSC3, plus some of the extensions we call SSC4A, which were on the Athlon 2 core. Uh, we also support VOL processor virtualization. We support a feature called misaligned 128, which allows for some more packed data structures. That was a feature on Athlon 2 as well. We also support what's called instruction-based sampling, which is a mechanism of collecting statistics on programs running during flight, and you can use that for dynamic optimization or for dynamic code scheduling. JITs can also use this. And lastly, not surprising, we've introduced C6 in this core as well. Uh, power gating to where we effectively save the internal state of the machine off to RAM and then power down the entire core on interrupt we can reload that state and pop back up very quickly. So with the focus of efficiency uh, this is kind of where we landed. Uh, we ended up with a dual wide machine. It's a dual x86 instruction decoder. It's also a dual retire machine. Uh, we also have complex micro ops. Some people like to refer to this as fused microops, although we've been doing it for about 10 years since the K7 days, so we call it complex microops. Uh, we also have a very, very good branch predictor, and we're not going to go into details here, but when parts come out, I think people will be very impressed with what we've got for such a small engine. Also, we've got a very aggressive out-of-order load store unit. And again, these are two of the features that help bring us into that efficiency point that we were looking for. We also, again, with virtualization, we support nested page tables, which allows for the hypervisor to really optimize some performance there. Uh, and we've also accelerated the VMCB world switch time through some various techniques. I mentioned low-level C6 power state powering the core down. We've also put some hooks in along the same lines of the VMCB move to move the C6 state in and out of the core very quickly. This is a rough diagram of the Bobcat core. I'd like to take a second to walk you through the pieces of it in some level of detail. First of all, the iCache, it's a 32K byte, two-way set associative, 64 byte line, parity protected iCache. Two-way set associative may seem a little unusual. It really allows us to do some 
power reduction schemes the way we're doing our branch handling and our branch prediction. As far as physical to the linear to physical address translation, we've got a 512 entry TLB for 4K pages, an 8 entry TLB for 2 meg pages, and this front end allows us to fetch 32 bytes per cycle. For a small machine that may seem overkill, it actually has some advantages in that we can get a line in and shut down the front end and save power. Branch predictors, uh, again, our branch predictor allows us to prefetch, uh, prefetch, predict two branches per cycle and process them. It also allows us to remember where branch locations were. That way you can stitch and cut off the appropriate points for branch takens. Uh, we've got, as Mike was alluding to, the standard return stack address predictor for call returns. And we've got a pretty good indirect predictor for predicting register indirect branches. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, I think we've got a probably best in class condition predictor. Uh, and the other aspect here is we have gone to some extremes to only clock up the structures that are needed. And we actually have layers of prediction where we will simply not light up a particular array or a particular structure unless it's really needed. And we have the correction mechanisms in the few cases where we might have missed it. The instruction decoder, uh, again, we've got a for those not familiar with x86, you can have instructions that run from 1 to 15 bytes. Uh, and so decoding these things is a bit of a challenge. Our instruction decoder looks for two x86 instructions out of a 22-byte window. Average x86 size is 4 to 5 bytes. So this may seem overkill again. But again, it's a way to keep from having to shift large queues around. The decoder can do the work without having to move data, which again is a power savings. I mentioned complex micro-ARPs, uh, and I think the risk CISC wars are over, but to give you a flavor for this, uh, our complex micro-ARPs, we can take, if you look at dynamic instruction counts, take all these applications, what's the frequency of occurrence of these instructions really running, you end up mapping about 89% of them to a single COP. You end up mapping about another 10% to a pair of COPs. And then your less than 1% actually ends up in microcode. So that gives you a flavor for the kind of translation and the power of the instruction set we have at the micro-op level. Integer execution. Uh, we have a pair of dual-ported schedulers, uh, the front end of the integer pipe. Uh, one scheduler feeds basically two separate integer execution units, the ALU engines. Uh, one of the ALUs also shares a port for the multiplier array. On the other side, there's another dual-ported scheduler, one feeding load agents and one feeding store agents. And they can balance, you know, basically what we found after a lot of ex work and a lot of simulation, this provided us a really good balance for the kind of performance we were looking for, given the size of machine we were building. Lastly, I ought to point out here, uh, physical register file. Again, there's different ways of doing register renaming. Uh, future files, for example, involve more data shifting and data copying than we wanted to deal with. What we've actually built is a physical register file using pointers to keep track of where register locations actually are in a pool of registers. And again, this is to minimize data movement and keep our power back down. Floating point. Uh, we have a couple of uh, decode and a rename stage at the front end of the pipe. Uh, they feed a centralized shared dual port scheduler, which actually launches into two execution stacks. We have replicated MMX and logic units on the two stacks, so they can go either direction. We have a MUL unit on one side of the stack. It's a pipeline MUL unit. It can sustain two single precision MULs per cycle. And on the add side, we have, again, a floating point pipeline to add unit, and it can sustain two floating point single precision adds per cycle. And as on the integer side, we've gone to a physical register file to keep power down. Data cache, it's a 32 kilobyte, eight-way set associative, parity protected. It is a write-back or a copy-back cache, depending on your taxonomy. Uh, and again, we've gone with eight-way set associative to get the hit rate up, obviously. Uh, as far as L the TLB partitions, it's a two-level TLB. It's a 40-entry 4K, eight-entry 2 meg on the first level. And you can see 512, 64-entry on the second level. Uh, and we've got part of this an eight stream prefetcher. Out of order load store unit. This is probably the other part that, that really bought us quite a bit performance for this class size machine. We can do full load bypassing loads, loads bypassing stores, even when the stores don't have their addresses. 
Uh, we can do stores bypassing of loads. Uh, we do have the hazard detection mechanisms and recovery mechanisms in place for both data dependencies and for memory order dependency issues that go on in flight. Uh, and we also have some predictors in place to allow us to break out of these pedantic cases where a load may be missing a store and thrashing. We do support very fast store load forwarding in the machine, and we do the obvious, the critical word fill forwarding for basically memory or L2 access is coming in. We can get those in the pipe pretty quick. L2 cache, it's 512K, 16-way set associative, 64-byte uh, lines. It is ECC protected. Uh, the main thing here, again, going back to the power theme, which you're probably getting tired of perhaps hearing, is it's a half-speed clocked L2. And again, this allows us to keep the power in that L2 structure down. We don't have to push VTs on the bit cells and what have you to get there. Bus unit, it can support eight outstanding data accesses, two outstanding fetch accesses. It, it's really the central coherency point of the machine. It manages coherency for the L1s, for the L2. It manages the aliasing issues in the iCache. It also helps forwarding with some of the SMC cases. So it, it's sort of central. In addition, it's the unit that talks to the North Bridge than the rest of the SOC. This is kind of a high level overview of the pipeline. Uh, again, the colors are kind of aligned up with the block diagram earlier if you want to line them up. Uh, effectively, it's the three, the, the main thing here to point out is fetch three, four, five overlap with decode. Those are some extra correction stages that can cause decode to be wiped out. Uh, you see a small bubble there for microcode instructions where the ROM gets read. Branch predict, mispredict latencies, 13 cycles. It's a, generally, it's a three cycle load use pipe with one cycle being dedicated for AGN. Uh, and then the L2 cache, it, again, it's 17 cycle latency. It's not a great latency, but for the power trade off, it was the right decision. This shows the rough floor plan. Uh, this is actually the taped out floor plan. Uh, you see, I guess, on the left hand side, the front end of the machine, the I cache, the branch predictors, the TLBs there, the structures. You also see the decode structures, the microcode ROM arrays, and the reorder buffer. The middle bay, what you find there, the energy unit, the load store unit, the data caches, floating point in the bus unit. And then on the far right, you see the L2 with the subarrays, the tags, and the control for the L2 sequencing. Now I'm going to get philosophical. I mean, the, the real question is, what do you do for low power design? And there's a couple things. You, you got to do the basics well. I mean, you, you got to do clock gating, you got to do power gating, you got to push non-critical paths as well as critical paths to get the VT mix up higher, get the leakage down. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of motherhood and apple pie things that you have to do. I think we've gone a little further. We've actually gone to some extremes to try to get data movement out of this pipeline. Uh, I mentioned the future file or the physical register file as opposed to the future file where you're not copying and shoveling data back and forth. We've also gone to some extremes in some of our structures to partition them to where they're not built in FIFOs anymore. They're built as, you know, cues with head tail pointers with indexes pointing back into them, pointer references going through the machine as opposed to shipping a lot of data around. Uh, we've also done some work in the load store unit. I won't go into detail, but allowed us to partition arrays to make them small, or make partition structures to make them smaller as opposed to building large general structures that really didn't need to see all the traffic. Some of these structures are more specialized to the tasks they're trying to do. Uh, a couple of examples here though, you know, we've talked about motherhood apple pie, and we've talked about basic good logic and microarchitecture design, but there's also what do you do in the performance trade-off? How do you find the knee of the curve? Uh, when do you make trade-offs that may, you know, on one machine may be inappropriate, on another machine may be appropriate? I'll give you a couple examples. We went to some extremes in the machine so that we get DTAG hit before we do cache read. That's a tight speed path, but for the power reasons, it's a trade-off we wanted to make. Another thing we did, as I mentioned a little earlier, is we have certain branch structures that we recall the flavor of branch we predicted last time, and we don't relight them up. We also have structures that predict whether certain branch structures should be lit up in a given cycle. So we've cascaded some of that into the design. 
I mentioned knee of the curve here. And what I mean by that is you, know, you can go after the ultimate performance machine or you can start making trade-offs on IPC versus power and finding that you don't need a 100 entry reorder buffer or a 5,000 entry reorder buffer to hit your IPC target. And finding the right spot both from an average sensitivity and effectively the glass jaw of the apps you're running, what apps really care about or what they don't. Another example here, more specific to the instruction decoder, some machines use marker bits. And the idea here is you mark instructions inside your iCache or in a separately indexed structure to tell you where your instruction boundaries are. And we made a decision early on to go back to what I would call a brute force x86 dual wide branch or instruction decoder that doesn't know about marker bits. Uh, one thing is it allowed us to get rid of a, a small array with a lot of bits in it that get read every cycle. Also it allows us to get rid of a correction pipeline that sometimes those bits aren't right and there's cases where you have to do this massive correction cancellation scheme. So sometimes going back to the brute force method, straightforward, straight through, you can get rid of a lot of the structures that waste time otherwise, or waste power otherwise. This kind of is rolling back to a summary. Uh, again, the main things I, I presume to walk away with, or I'd suggest walking away with, it's a dual wide machine. Uh, two of our main features are the out of order load store unit and a very aggressive, very advanced branch predictor machine. Uh, we've got good floating point performance. It's a full 64-bit instruction set. It's got full virtualization support. Uh, it's got a rich ISA feature set involved. And, and the second part of this is, you know, all the performance and feature set aside, we've gone to some extremes here to make this a very low power machine. It, it's a tiny machine. Uh, and allows us to take it a lot of different way, directions also because of the fact that it's synthesizable. Uh, summary, a uh, couple things, I mean, again, these aren't real descriptive, but they may give you a flavor for what we're talking about. Uh, it's estimated based on our simulations to give us about 90% of the performance of today's mainstream notebook in that lower end notebook space. Uh, it's somewhat sub one watt capable. And again, the main thing is we can take it very quickly to a number of manufacturing trade-offs, a number of different process fads and what have you. Lastly, before I get remiss is, you know, I've had the pleasure of presenting this, but the reality is there's a team of a lot of people involved behind this that put a lot of dedication and hard work into it. And they're really the folks that deserve the credit for the work. And I guess questions at this point. John Davis, Microsoft Research. In your presentation, you showed some type of memory protection at all the levels. Does Bobcat also support ECC for DRAM? That's actually an SOC issue, as opposed to the Bobcat core itself. Uh, and and the, the fact there's nothing to prevent us from doing that, but we're not really talking about the SOC rollouts at this point. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, hi, Brad. <clears throat> Peter Polito, Intel Corporation. Uh, you mentioned the on-die power gating. I was wondering if you could comment on the granularity of that feature. On the what particular of that feature? Uh, the granularity of that granularity. feature. Granularity. Uh, the power gating is at a core level, although it is integrated within the core design itself. Uh, I guess that answers your comment question, Pete. Uh, this is Jeff Howard, Intel Corp. Do you uh, find that there was much commonality or reuse between the Bobcat and Bulldozer design teams? Was there any attempt to do that? It's sort of a hard question to answer, but I'll try to answer it best I can. Uh, we worked in two different sites, which has some challenges as far as sharing commonality. Uh, I think we did leverage a lot of code in some areas and not in others. Uh, and even AMD in general, there's a lot of you know, for example, microcode is somewhat jo not jointly managed. You have people responsible in different programs, but they do work closely together to make things you know, seem together. Uh, there are areas where we did collaborate back and forth on various trade-offs we're running into, but you also have to realize these design points are dramatically different. So it's not going to be easy to take the RTL from a very you know, short clock or short tick design and take it down to a different core that's really more focused on power. Okay, thanks. 
Hi, Brad. Uh, Gra <coughs> Graham Murphy, Oracle Corporation. Hey, Graham. Hi. Great presentation. Uh, you had a bullet on an earlier slide that said uh, you had an out-of-order load store with hazard prediction. Would you be able to elaborate on that feature? Without going into a whole lot of detail, there are cases where a load will bypass a store, the store doesn't have its address yet, and you can end up having to replay and flush out parts of the machine. We have a mechanism in place to predict those hazards and keep us from having to get into pedantic situations. And that way we recognize and predict it going forward and keep from thrashing. Thank you. Uh, Bill Rash, Intel Corporation. As part of the low power uh, feature set of the core design, uh, what flavor of a foundry process did you select? The general version or the uh, low power version? This is actually in TSMC 40G. Uh, it's, so it's really the performance version. Uh, but we've gone to some fairly extremes to push VTs up and only use the low VTs when we need to. And so it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off of where you're partitioning and where you're sending the market. Uh, and at the same time, we have the ability to port this core in many directions, depending on what we want to do. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Sanjeev from Oracle. Uh, uh, question about the L1 right back. That's what I thought I heard from you say that. Can you comment about uh, the performance difference as compared to L1 right through versus L1 right back uh, in general? Performance difference, it depends on the structures you put in place. It depends on the right gathering, how you do buffering, how you do your bandwidth management. I would argue a little differently. Uh, in the particular arena that we're in, low power wise, I think there's some advantages to having a right back cache uh, because basically we can keep the data movement between the two caches a little lower. Uh, I think somebody asked earlier about trade-offs of inclusive or ex exclusive caches. Uh, Bobcat in particular is a form of inclusion, although it's not formally enforced, but you know, not having to do all those copybacks back and forth as frequently for an inclusive cache or exclusive cache is, is a power savings trade-off. In a similar view with right back, I think for the market that we're targeting with Bobcat, a right back was the right trade-off because we're not doing as many pushes to the larger L2 array. Thank you. Uh, David Cantor, Real World Tech. Uh, Question for you about uh, changes to the cache hierarchy to improve uh, power efficiency. How do you uh, handle most of your evictions from L1? Do you tend to swap into L2 like a normal exclusive, or do you silently evict unless well, dirty? Yeah, I think I was trying to drive it. It may not have come across. If you look at the K8 family, for example, it's an exclusive cache. Lines are brought into the L1, and then they get evicted to the L2, whether they're clean or dirty. Uh, the Bobcat core actually brings them into both the L1 and the L2 and only does the eviction for dirty D-side lines. Thanks. Okay. Um, Jose Renaud uses Santa Cruz. Uh, for specking live performance, not a spec FP, uh, how will you compare relative the Bobcat with the Bulldozer? Because in spec FP, I see a big difference. Specking might depend. What do you think? I'm not sure if I've ever compared the specifics. Uh, Again, I would expect if you're looking at IPC, the bulldozer is going to have a higher IPC because they've stretched higher up into the performance realm. Uh, we've actually made some trade-offs, trading off some levels of performance to get down into the power envelopes we're looking for. So I don't know if that directly answers. I don't have a specific measure in, in my head, but you won't see comparable performance, I wouldn't think, on spec int benchmarks as an example, especially some of the larger ones which are more cash intensive. All right, let's thank our speaker. And we now have some uh, closing remarks. Here they are. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, that's it. The last slide has been presented, the last speaker heard, and the last snack has been consumed. This is the end of Hot Chips 22. As you probably noticed, the proceedings you have on your flash drives are not completely up to date. Here at Hot Chips, we stay so close to the technology frontiers that sometimes the slides are being revised even as the talk is in progress. To bring you up to the minute, we will be placing the updated copies of all talks and the keynote addresses on our website as soon as we can. And as the, when this is done, we'll be sending you an email with the password. Similarly, we will post the videos of the conference as soon as we have finished the editing process. 
We will also send you an email and notify you of this event. Obviously, a conference of this size requires the efforts of many people. Over 60 volunteers, professionals like yourself, support this conference. First and foremost are the volunteers of our program committee, led this year by Jose Renault and Will Etherton. And they're out there someplace. Jose? Will? Yeah. Thank you. Now, without thanking each and every one by name, here I must recognize the fine efforts of my colleagues on the organizing committee who handle everything from registration to publicity to catering. And even a high-tech conference requires a lot of lugging and lifting. For this, we have enlisted the services of 15 student volunteers who, among other things, work hard to keep the drinks cold on hot days like today. In the end, Hot Chips is a conference for you, the attendees and the speakers. We work hard each year to improve our performance and improve your conference experience. We would really appreciate any feedback you have, positive or negative. Please take a few moments to fill out the blue evaluation forms that you were handed when you came to the conference and turn them in at the desk up front. Personally, I would be pleased to hear from any of you about any question, comments, or suggestions so that we can improve next year's conference. Please feel free to send me an email through our website and I'll answer each and every one. Finally, we appreciate the support of our sponsors who enable us to improve the reach and scope of this conference. Thank you for attending Hot Chips 22 and we hope to see you next August on a nice cool day for Hot Chips 23.